Coming up on today's Locked On Senators, it's game day. The Sens are back home, about to face the Tampa Bay Lightning. But Ross, we had some news overshadowing that. What's better than Mark Mathot joining Locked On Senators podcast? What? Him joining with breaking news that Tyler Clevin has signed his entry-level contract with the Ottawa Senators. We'll get into all that and more. This is the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team. Every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson, and you're listening to Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Tim Stützle, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. Welcome inside episode 762 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains, please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast available on YouTube as well. Today is Thursday, March 23rd and Pillsy, it's not goodbye, it's see you later to the hashtag Nodak Sends. Yep, with Tyler Clevin signing his entry-level contract and turning pro, joining the Ottawa Senators there for the first time in a long time, Ross. There are no Ottawa Senators prospects in NODAC right now, but I have a feeling with Pierre Dorian at the helm here, that won't last too long. I want everyone to know that the last time that North Dakota played a hockey game without a Sens prospect, the Hamburglar was in goal for the Ottawa Senators. (laughs) Wow. The Hamburglar. It's been eight years. It's been since March 2015. And then the Sens drafted Christian Willannon. And then it was Shane Pinto. Sorry. Then it was Jacob Bernard Docker and Johnny Tyconic. Then it was Shane Pinto. Then it was Jake Sanderson. And the next day, it was Tyler Clevin. So the last one to come in is the last one to leave. And Tyler Clevin will be joining the Ottawa Senators for practice tomorrow. Of note, and when we record, this is a Frankenstein episode. We'll pull the curtain back. We've already recorded with Mark Mathot, and then we recorded with Brad Schlossman. We put a little teaser up on YouTube. You can check that video out. Full interview coming tomorrow. You know Brad, friend of the show, works with the Grand Forks Herald, one of the best college hockey reporters in the country, and he joins us tomorrow to break down this whole signing. But Mark Mathot said that if you're the agent, you're looking for guarantee that NHL games are coming. Pierre Dorian just spoke to the media, and who knows whether it's Pierre Dorian speaking or PR Dorian speaking, but he says there's no guarantee that Tyler Clevin gets into an NHL game. I mean, he has to say that, right? Because ultimately, it's not his decision. He can put Tyler Clevin there at DJ Smith's disposal, but he's maintained all along it's DJ Smith's team. He's going to make the lineup choices, as it should be. Like, he's, he's the coach. If, if he's not uh, delegating that, uh, then what's the point of having him there? He has to make those decisions. But I would be very surprised, Ross, if we don't at least see Tyler Clevin in the mix here, especially when the season gets closer and closer and we have a better idea of whether this team is in the playoffs or not. I'll okay. say that. Okay, yeah, you got two paws left right now. We got the paws, yep. Tampa Bay, um, should I let you know right now or should we save it for a little game day preview? What what are you letting me know? What's the secret? Brian Elliott starts in goal for the Tampa Bay Lightning. (sighs) That's that's interesting. I want to hit some Vasilevsky stats here just quickly because we famously said we want Vasilevsky uh, earlier on, but... It's so weird, Ross, because this is from the Tampa Bay Lightning game preview on their page. Vasilevsky is riding a six-game win streak versus Ottawa with a .924 save percentage and a 1.98 goals against average. That's obviously incredible. But if you go to his hockey reference, his splits, he's at a .898 save percentage and a .299 goals against. So obviously the Sens lit him up early in his career because lately he's been thriving. So... From that point, it's nice not to see Vasilevsky, but from the point of a certain LOSP graphic of former goalies up against their old team in the Ottawa Senators, that never looks good. So, I mean, either way you slice it, the Sens are in for a tough game here. Yeah, Brian Elliott, 7-1-2 in his career against Ottawa in 11 games. 
a 917 save percentage, but that's one of two storylines from Tampa because we have another hashtag sends abroad. Our boy Kevin Hemana pointed this out on Twitter. Nick Paul has missed the last couple potential returns to Ottawa, so we're going to get a very well-deserved scoreboard tribute tonight for Nick Paul. It's his first time playing in Ottawa since the trade. Yeah, it's crazy that uh, he hasn't made it back here since. And I, I think it's one of those universal things that all Sens fans still love Nick Paul. There's no animosity. I mean, um, he got a chance to go to Tampa, play for a Stanley Cup, and he eliminated the Leafs in uh, in a game seven. Two goals in that game, in a 2-1 game. And he signs a big ticket with Tampa. So we all love Nick Paul. Nick Paul does it all. 100% does it all and I expect a raucous standing ovation is he standing ovation worthy I think just because he was a guy that was in this organization so long and oh, he, Binghamton. yeah yeah it's insane to think and he just did things the right way so if if I'm in Ottawa tonight boots on the ground I'm getting up and clapping I'll tell you that much all right let us know in the comments is Nick Paul standing ovation worthy this guy who's career high in points was like what 20 but I think he brings so much more to that. He brings it all to the table when you talk about Nick Paul and uh, the fact that he was still donating to the mental health initiative at the Royal Ottawa Hospital even after leaving to Tampa. He kept that Points by Paul initiative going. I think he he certainly deserves a very fond welcome back until the puck drops and it sends lightning tonight. The Senators still six points back of the uh, Florida Panthers, but seven points back now. I was going to say, the final yeah. playoff spot because the Pittsburgh Penguins beat the Colorado Avalanche just last night. But let's get a little bit more of the Tyler Clevin fallout, if choo, you will. Choo. He's never been to Ottawa before. So this is going <laughs> to yeah. be a wild ride for him. And I'm sure an, an eye-opening experience is he's going to get to meet the team tomorrow. So we assume no visa issues are, are expected here. And um, I hope we see him in sooner rather than later. I probably wouldn't put him in for that Monday game. But that Thursday game against the Flyers, to me, would be the perfect introduction to the NHL. Yeah, I agree. Because that gives him a little bit of time to get uh, kind of accustomed to the boys oh, yeah. and uh, the NHL and the routine and stuff like that. So I definitely think that's good. Ross, maybe Noodles can give uh, Tyler Clevin a tour of Ottawa with all the Noodles facts about Ottawa. He's got to know all the good spots to hit. So definitely, uh, hopefully the Nodak boys can make him feel welcomed and this is a sigh of relief for us as uh, we were getting close to your panic button timer here. So we don't need to worry about that anymore. Tyler Clevin is an Ottawa Senator. Well, if you listen to yesterday's Locked On Senators, you would have just been going about your morning because there's nothing to worry about when it comes to Tyler Clevin signing until 5 p.m. Central today. And it was at about 9.30 a.m. Central time that we got the news. Tyler Clevin is an Ottawa Senator and the note accents, we need to reload. And tomorrow, we get a couple names from Brad Schlossman as well. I had to ask. I said, who could be next? We need to refill this pipeline. Christian Willannon famously said, Nodak doesn't rebuild, they reload. And we got to reload on Sens prospects at North Dakota. But really exciting times. He does bring an element that the Senators simply don't have on the back end. That mean streak. That guy who is going to dominate physically and... I'm not going to give away the whole interview, but man, Brad Schlossman may have said the most eye-popping comparison. I'll leave it at that for now. But to, we also have probably, I would say, Tyler Clevin prototype coming on next with Mark Mathot. Yeah, I mean, if Tyler Clevin can uh, have a career like Mark Mathot, I think everyone would be pretty happy with that. So. We always love having meth on the show and uh, we have a lot of laughs and get into the the decor here a lot more than uh, we, well, no, not a lot more, but just as we usually do with Mark Mathot, it's very defense focused. And we discussed the water bottle squirt for uh, Sidney Crosby in the Eastern Conference final. All that's coming up, but Pilsy, give me a locked on player tonight before we move off of today's game day preview. A reminder that after the game, you can join the Leams Martian and Brandon Piller in the postcast live on our YouTube channel. Don't be shy to throw it a subscription. We're handing them out for the low, low price of absolutely free. Free, free. It's absolutely free. Uh, I wish Matthew Joseph was playing. He would be my locked on player for this for sure. You know what? I'm going to go with Eric Brandstrom just because 
this Tyler Clevin signing, that's uh, Brandy's probably feeling that heat, being like, okay, there's another guy. Usually, no pun intended, but Brandy has drawn the short straw when it comes to uh, roster spots on the defense there. So Brandy's got to say, hey, I'm still in now. I've got a chance to prove myself. He's done really good up with Thomas Shabbat. That won't be the case here as it looks like he's going to play with Hamnick. Uh, TSN 1200 reporting that uh, it's likely that Chikrin and Shabbat are going to see some time today. So I think if you're Eric Brandstrom, you need to take advantage of this time right now. And I, I, I'm a Brandy guy. I want to see him succeed. And just because Clevin's coming in now, maybe that'll take his roster spot now. But if down the future there's a chance that Tyler Clevin on the left side, Brandy on the right side, third pair, I think he could have some magic there. So I'm going to be locked on to Eric Branson tonight. I'm going to be locked on to Jacob Chikrin, who was not on the ice for the morning skate, but afterwards, DJ Smith says he is good to go tonight. So we're good to go to Mark Mathot. We're going to carry him through the rest of this show. It's all coming up. You're listening to Locked On Senators. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Indeed. Guys, if you are looking to hire, you need to check out Indeed. You need Indeed because they are the top spot for hiring. They can help you attract, interview, and hire all in the same place. It's the only job site where you can find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. That's how they do it. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites, get it all done on the best job site. They partner with you every step of the way, and you can help with instant match assessment and virtual interviews. They got it all set up for you. So start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. That offer is valid through March 31st. Go to Indeed.com slash LockedOn to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. That's Indeed.com slash LockedOn, and you will find the candidate you need for your job. Check it out, guys. Indeed.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Glebe Central Pub. You know we love our friends at the Glebe Central Pub. We love them so much. It's pretty much family every time we go to 779 Bank Street. That's where you can find the Glebe Central Pub, right in the heart of the Glebe. Perfect spot to go on the way to check out the 67s. If you're just cruising around Lansdowne, wherever you end up in the Glebe, it's always important to stop at the Glebe Central Pub. They also have great events, whether you're talking about open mic nights, whether you're talking about speed dating, whether you're talking about just going and shooting darts with the boys and having a Guinness. They always have great deals every Friday. Guinness pints under $8. You kidding me right now? Love that at the Glebe Central Pub. You can always go to theglebecentralpub.com as well and find out when their send shuttle is running. They run to and from the games for $15. What a steal. So check them out at 779 Bank Street. And when you head there, make sure you let them know that Locked On Senators sent you. We love our friends at the Glebe Central Pub. We want you to follow them on Instagram as well, at Glebe Central Pub, and you can find out when all their events are ongoing. I'm already looking forward to my next visit, and I hope you are too. You can find them next at the Glebe Central Pub, in the heart of the Glebe at 779 Bank Street. And yeah, let them know that Locked On Sends sent you. All right. Here's our conversation for the rest of the show with former Ottawa Senator, NHL defenseman. Here's Mark Mathot. All right, we now welcome back one of our favorite friends of the show. It's been a while. We've both been down to Mexico separately since we last had this former NHLer on. And we know athletes are tough, and this man is proving it today. Battling through a head cold to be here. Mark Mathot, welcome back. How are you doing today, brother? I'm <laughs> I'm good, man. You know, as you said, battling through it. I uh, I just told you guys before we started, I took a shitload of nasal spray to like clear myself up a little bit, so I don't sound like I'm you know wincing anymore. But um, yeah, it sucks, man. There's a there's a cold going around. Thought it might be COVID because almost everybody we were on vacation with, they all live in Vancouver. Uh, my sisters, um, my sister in laws, in laws, I should say, that were all there. All came down with it when they got back home. So I did a test yesterday just for fun, just to see. Not that it makes a difference, but I was negative. So uh, here we are. It's probably just a bad cold. All good. You fought it with margaritas then. You were able to keep that virus going. <laughs> Had a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that always helps. The mimosas, you get that vitamin C right away, and uh, you're good to go for the day. That's I like, I, I, you know, I was just going to say, like, 
what I this was our first trip going away with the kids. Okay. And um we stayed at like a on like a villa, right? So it we didn't book it. It was just like a big Airbnb uh, and had a few families on site. And we were up like probably a good kilometer away from the beach, which we couldn't swim in anyway, because we're on the Pacific and my kids are three and five years old. So by day four or five, both of them wanted to leave. Like they just wanted to leave. And there was fucking scorpions oh, that I was no. killing with my flip-flops, venomous scorpions. Uh, it just wasn't a great trip with the kids. Um, and then of course the late night travel on the way home with air trans Adam, basically by the shitters at the back of the plane, which would explain probably why I'm sick. Cause the amount of people that shoulder checked me as I walked by at an aisle seat. Um, so I know I sound like a prima donna right now, but you know, we knew what we were getting into. Uh, but I'm not doing that again with the kids. You know, next time we go anywhere, it's going to be a family resort with a kid zone and it can buy us a couple hours during the day. That's a that's a vet move here, but you gotta you gotta become <laughs> veterans, right? You don't just learn right away. First, you learn. You get there, you learn. Did you all your your uh, clothing make it to and from? Any watches stolen? That was that was the uh, word of the Jamaica trip. Yeah, no, no, no. We were good, and you know what? People are like, we love Mexico. Like everyone's so friendly. We love Jamaica too. That wasn't my first time in Jamaica. Unfortunately, a lot of st- stuff got stolen. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, man, we had a, we had a blast. You know, the, the the airport was a little bit of a shit show. I still wonder why they decided to get married during March break. Um, <laughs> they don't have kids, but somehow they figured, hey, let's go during the worst. You know, during the worst time of the year. Uh, but anyway, we 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 got through it. We. We had so much fun that I paid extra money to leave two days early. So, yeah. <laughs> Damn. Well, I mean, you got to get away from uh, from the winter once in a while. So at least yeah. was, the, was the weather at least good, Mark? You gotta it was get great. Some sort of positive here. It was great. It was great. Okay, and, good. you know, like I said, if that situation would have been fine. Look, I, I people probably don't want to hear me talk about my vacation anymore. So, yeah, we can move on. But it was a good trip. <laughs> you came back two days early so you could watch Ottawa Senators hockey, hey? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey Ross, that's a new lid you got there. Yeah, nice, eh? Shout out Gong Show for these. That's a Gong Show hat. Yeah, man. Man, Gong Show, and this isn't like a, this is just a shameless plug, I guess. I'm not getting paid for this. Their hats are the best. Like I saw those yep. Chris Neal hats they made up yep. uh, for for Chris Neal night. Man, oh man, like like everyone, I still I still see people rocking them around the city when I go to like Costco or something. They're, like they're legit. So I got to get one of those right there. Yeah, and the talking. bucket hats are clutch for vacations. The Sens bucket hats is. Bill, uh, you're, you're a bucket well. hat guy. You're a bucket hat guy, eh? es- especially on vacation. Like it's just, <laughs> it's a vibe. It's a vibe. I feel it, man. I feel it. That's yeah, cool. I'm still having a laugh. I had the Amish beard going when uh, when we met you at the Neil game. That's hilarious. There's a world where I'm still talking to him, by the way, and, and he's still <laughs> try- he's still trying to move on to his <laughs> to his Dude, thing. You're overplaying that so much. I could. I've got a pretty uh, good grip on like that those social interactions and when like they start to feel a little awkward i never felt any of that whatsoever so yeah it, it, it wasn't like embarrassing but it was just like it's time to move on now <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all it was like it wasn't way too much it was just like okay ross like we'll get to this later <laughs> yeah, that's fair that's just thought of how cool it was they left through the penalty box who came up with that idea man <laughs> <laughs> oh man well hey we appreciate you jumping on this uh this last stretch has been uh exciting i appreciated that the senators made the trade and then kept winning while we were on vacation but uh it seemed like on the way home uh, matt you know the pills was at the game in chicago what a one to pick eh oh of oh. all the games too the That's... worst game i've ever seen in my life and i was so yeah. fired up about it it was so it was just dead like they yeah. they had zero jam i know i feel for you i it's funny even a couple there's a couple in in uh in mexico some of the like cousins of my in-laws um they were they were watching that game specifically for whatever reason and we had like a 15 minute talk about how bad the game was so <laughs> i mean you weren't alone we get it yeah. and this is uh Pilsy, what was the last road game you went to a 6-1 loss in montreal a 5-1 <laughs> loss in Montreal. So, like, I'm done following this team on the road. I'll, I'll visit tough. them in the comfort of the CTC for now. Yeah, good call. Good call. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. No more groupie moves for yeah. – no, Until we go to Seattle and Vancouver. That's got to be on the radar, though. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. We'll get make there. that happen. Um, I saw you tweeted yesterday about the brands from Shabbat pair. You want to expand your thoughts on uh, on just how it's working? Because I think that's the bigger surprise versus, you know, the fact that they were finally put together. Because 
Um, at some point you had to try everything with how things were going defensively. Yeah. Like I think, I think for me, you know, like I'm not sitting at home. I, I probably should. And I, I might actually do this tonight. Cause I'm not, I'm not doing the game. I had to text the producer this morning and be like, dude, no bueno. Like I'm going to be, I don't want to get everybody sick on, on, on the set. And I look like shit. Um, I think for me, watching Branstrom play now, it's not just Branstrom, but I'm noticing Shabbat's play kind of settle. Now there, there, there are. It's never just one answer, right? People like to look for that one, that one variable that's sort of affecting, you know, change in a good or bad way. But in this case, it's more uh, probably. I, I would probably equate it to Shabbat playing less minutes. That's one that most players would probably disagree with because everybody wants to play more, but. I think with Thomas Shabbat, it's allowed him to play more meaningful minutes. And then you got, you got him with a player in Branstrom who's very intelligent with the puck. We all know that there's no secret. I've, I've criticized some aspects of his game in the past. I still will if I need to, uh, but I like to be fair and, and, you know, I'm not going to die on a hill just because I said something three or four months ago, my, my opinions can change. Um, and, and I just think that, he looks more settled. I think, well, both of them look more settled and Brandstrom. He's still going to lose. He's still going to lose puck battles at net front. He's still going to get out muscled. Sometimes that's just, that's just, you know, that's physics, right? you got a bigger, stronger player. He's going to push you out of the way. That'll happen, but I can live with that. Um, what I do like is his play along the walls. I think he's starting to figure out how to win those puck battles too, which is huge. Um, but for whatever reason, sometimes it's not even that deep. It's just two players coming together and sort of being on the same page, right? Like when Eric Carlson went down years ago when I was playing with Ottawa and he 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 blew his Achilles, I was paired with Griba for most of the year. And Eric Griba and I are met our analytics might have been obviously different, you know, because we're not getting thrown out for ozone face-offs all the time. We were more used, you know, the opposite end uh, of the spectrum. But but Griba and I found chemistry and for whatever it was, we just we were able to use each other quite a bit. And in my play, I never felt like my play regressed that much when I played with them. That's because we just had good chemistry. And so with Thomas Shabbat and Eric Branstrom, they just seem to be clicking right now. My only issue with that, and I'll let you guys chime in on this if you want, where does that leave players like Chick, Chikrin, I call him Chick, Chikrin and, and uh, Hamannick. Like So going into next year, if you're looking at pairings, I'm not very comfortable with that pairing. I don't think you're using Chikrin properly. So it has a ripple effect every time you make an adjustment in the pairings, right? So so I guess I'll leave it at this. Shabbat and Branstrom are working just fine right now. Great. I love that. I just I have I just have some worries going into next year. If that's what you're going to roll with, are you comfortable with that as your top four? Uh, you know, and I, I know you could with the lineup a little bit. Some players are going to play a little bit more special teams, and that gives them their minutes. I just don't know where you go from there. You're singing the same song I did in the postcast the other night. I think you're kind of limiting Chikrin when you put him in a shutdown pair role. There you go. Yep. There's so much offensive potential with him. Um, I just wonder if he's telling the coach maybe he doesn't want to play the right side either. This whole right side, left side debate we could yeah. probably do for hours where it's like yeah. at some point somebody's going to move over there and Branstrom's doing a good job and- as well. But what about uh, what about a Sanderson Chikrin pair? I wouldn't mind that. Yeah. Well, I would love that. But then it's like I don't know. Yeah. And then what do you do with? You only have two righties back there, and you're going to put them both on the same pair, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. yeah. And, and 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 I when I started my career, and I'm not going to go into detail because I've already talked about this lots. But when I started my career, I played with Feder Tutin, who was a pretty good defenseman at the time. Came came in from the New York Rangers. He was in Columbus. And in my second, I think it was my second year in Columbus, I was paired with him. He was my guy and we were on the top pairing and um, he just couldn't play the right. Like whatever it was in his mind, if even mid shift, if somehow we got switched, I could hear him with that thick Russian accent yelling at me, Matt, Matt, switch. And it was like <laughs> mid play as we were defending. I'm like better, like no, but my point is not every defenseman is comfortable doing it. And no matter what they'll say in the media, you know, like Chikrin or any of these guys, they may not, in fact, be comfortable playing on the offside. And 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 obviously, they're going to do everything they can to accommodate the team's needs. You want to be a team player, but at but but at some point, um, you know, you're going to start worrying about your own play, and you don't want to you don't want to be you know um, a disservice to the team and or yourself moving forward because you're playing on that uncomfortable side. So every pass you accept is going to be on your backhand. 
every time you're coming out of the D zone on your offside, you're forced towards the wall on your backhand. Like there are a lot of uncomfortable uh, scenarios that happen when you're playing your offside. So you need a very competent player. That's why, that's why a player like Brandstrom doesn't surprise me that he's, that he's doing a pretty good job because he's compact. Uh, he's a good puck handler. He's efficient with the puck. So it's working for him, but I don't see that as a viable long-term solution. And that's where I think that the, the team's probably going to pick another righty up this summer. They, they have to, at, at this point, you can't rely on Hamannick in your top six consistently. If you're looking to be a legitimate playoff contender. Yeah. And I think the, the thing with Brandy too, is I think it works for him on the right side when he's playing with Shabbat because yes. DJ Smith mentioned it. Like he doesn't want a uh, puck moving defenseman on their offside when they're the guy transitioning the puck all the time. So if he can rely on Shabbat to transition that puck on on uh, his left side, I think it works out there. Now, Good point. Uh, Matt, I want to get uh, your just your overall opinion on Chikrin. I, you mentioned quickly you thought he'd be good with Sanderson. You think maybe the Hamannick pair is kind of limiting him. What's your overall impression with how they've used him so far? Well, I mean, uh, I, I think they're using him as best they can because, of course, you're still accommodating other D pairings that we just talked about, right? So I think as a result, you know, they're going to pair him with somebody that perhaps has been struggling a little bit or like, like we talk about Hamannick. I mean, he's been playing with Sanderson all year. So I know we're ooing and eyeing over his play and, and props to, to, to Travis Hamannick for the hard play and the hard nose play and, and not quitting on plays or however you want to describe it. The, the effort is there, but he's also been, been sheltered a little bit playing with a player like Sanderson. Sanderson has been terrific. So obviously whoever's playing with Sanderson is going to look pretty good. Um, so the next best available option, in my opinion, is Chikrin. He's that other guy who he's very strong. He's got a terrific stick and that's, I mean, he's, he's very, he's jacked. All right. So that one arm, those one arm stick plays where he's breaking up plays, that's just strength, anticipation, um, good awareness. And, and he's very good at that. So on that same note, I don't know that you're utilizing him as much and you're probably handicapping him a little bit from an offensive perspective and output, right? So you're going to be holding him back a little bit in that regard, but um, for now it's working again. And, I, and I'm going to keep saying this. I'm going to say this all off season. I don't know that that's a, a legitimate pairing moving forward. I'd love to see a player like Sanderson to your point there, Pilsy playing with a guy like Chickard, because that's just going to open up everything for a player like Sandy. Right? So uh, again, the concern is, and I'm going to keep saying this, it's just playing on your offside. I don't see that working long-term but I could be wrong. So with Chikrin, I mean, much has been made about his, uh, his diet since he's been here. Now I'm going to put a new spin on it. Who was the, who was the most, I don't want to say dedicated, but who had the strangest diet? Colin Greening. Colin Greening. Yeah. And, and, and I know people, I, I, I didn't like this. There were some people criticizing Chick for this, like some other notable accounts too. that were like, Throwing like some, I won't, I won't name them, but I saw a couple people throwing a little shade his way for eating raw meat and equating it to like a Joe Rogan podcast or something. And it's like, look, the organ meat thing is actually very good for you. The raw angle, I don't do. I'm not, I'm not advocating for that. I think it's better when you cook your meat. I believe you absorb more nutrients when your meat is cooked, but if it's working for check and in case anybody haven't noticed, like, look at the, look at the guy. He's a specimen. I think, I think I mean, it's working. He is. He, I think it's working just fine for Chick. So, like, maybe just let him do what he wants. But, uh, I mean, everyone's different. But now with all the information out and, and, and the benefits involved around the meat diets, I mean, and we don't know what kind of issues perhaps. Maybe he has some stomach issues and this is better for him. Like, we don't know. But I love it. I think it's great. Um, I'm sure he's doing his homework right now as to where he's going to be buying his meat. I know Bearbrook Farm sells a lot of exotic stuff here in Ottawa. A lot uh, of people a couple. Are saying- a lot of people are saying farm to fork. Farm to farm fork. to fork's great. They farm just don't have fork, a lot of the yeah. exotic meats that Bearbrook has. Like at Bearbrook here in Ottawa, just outside of town, you can buy kangaroo sausage and rattlesnake meat. Like there's there's everything. So it's a little different and extreme. But I mean, I like bison. I eat a lot of bison meat. We make we had bison burgers last night here, me and the kids. Uh, but for for check, I get it. When you're in it, you're an athlete. You're looking for any edge and advantage you can get because you're in a pool of hyper competitive people and everyone's constantly constantly looking for that next thing that could give you a little bit of an edge over the, your competitor so uh for him i'm sure he's finding his way right now he's a great guy I, I can't stress this enough i've met his grandfather i know his dad very well we ran an octagon camp together here in the summer this this past summer great people very down to earth 
mild mannered people. Um, his old man is fantastic. So, uh, good hockey family. You think his old man would come on the pod in the summer? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, his dad's great. His dad does a lot of TV work too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Jeff, yeah. Good. Yeah. He's, he's great. Very, very smart, very smart guy and, um, has a lot of great insight. So we, like I said, we exchanged a lot of great ideas this summer and I got to pick his brain a little bit, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, I can't say enough of them. All right. That's, uh, coming soon to a locked on senators near you, but wait, what the hell does uh, Colin greening do that? So that's so different. Oh, great. Yeah. We went way off there. Yeah. Greener greener was just nuts when it came to like everything, like greener was wearing those blue light glasses at nighttime in his hotel room. Uh, you know, after eight o'clock or whatever it was now, of course you have the option on your phone to switch it to night mode, which I do. It sets, it automatically switches at 7 PM, but yeah, greener would sit there and watch TV with these little blue light glasses on and his diet was very strict. I mean, and greeting, you know, no coincidence. He was a machine. He was the fittest guy in our hockey club, uh, incredibly smart guy. Uh, and just knew what he was putting in his body. And, and I mean, if I could go back in time, I wasn't like that. I, you know, a pregame meal, I was putting Alfredo sauce on my pasta and having some chicken and I wasn't really that strict. Uh, but, but if I could go back, that's one element I would probably change, particularly in my early years and greener greener was like that. I mean, he was regimented even with meals on the road. When we go to dinners, like it would be, you know, fish and a light, uh, brown rice with maybe a side of vegetables. He was he was cognizant of the type of oils his food was cooked in, uh, which now we know, like all the palm oils and all that shit oil that almost everything we buy and eat is cooked in uh, is poison. So anyway, he was onto something. And who's the worst eater of any teammate you had? <laughs> uh, you know what? It was probably the superstitious guys. Like yeah. uh, like Neeler was a machine and he was always in pretty good shape. But you know he was he was a uh, he was a slave to his diet, to his, to his routine. And so if it was a 12, uh, 12 noon game, he was still getting up at 7 AM and pounding chicken and like pasta with ranch. And it was always hidden Valley ranch. Oh. And he had to have his hidden Valley ranch for him at the buffet on the road. So guys like that were still in great shape. I'm not chirping them, but not all their diets were great. And a lot of that was just habit. That ranch is pretty good. Not going to lie. It's great but, ranch. Uh, if, I, if I was a pro athlete, I probably wouldn't have a travel one with me. Um, yeah. But speaking of staying healthy, a, a guy that maybe not the food wise, but the sleep regimen, we talked to Jake Sanderson. He's a big sleep guy. And maybe yeah. that's helped him uh, recently as he's playing in the most games he's played in a yeah. season in his entire career. And meth, it seems like even despite that, the later on in the season, it's almost like the better he's getting, which I guess more time, more experience here, figuring it out. Yeah. But he's, he's now, I think most Sens fans are kind of in agreement is he's slowly kind of overtaken Shabbat as the top defenseman on this team. I mean, you look at the minutes, he's getting more minutes most nights. He's the yeah. guy on the top power play. He's playing shorthanded. Like what can you say about Jake Sanderson uh, emerging into this role so soon in his career? And I just want yeah. to jump in there, Matt, and say that he's played 20 more games than yeah. his previous season high, which he did at the U.S. program. So the funny thing with that, and that's usually the, the, the toughest adjustment, you're seeing it with guys like Pinto and Greg. Matty Bermeers, uh, I think a lot of people have said, like, you can see that uh, college kid like him, this stretch is getting to him. Yes, and there's no there's no coincidence there. I mean, that's yeah. that's a real thing, right? I mean think about it. You're going from playing 50 games or whatever it is to, to 82. It's insane. It's a huge jump. And it, depending on what league, of course you're playing in, but um, with Sanderson, it's interesting because I, I am genuinely surprised his play has, has kept up this consistently for this long. I mean, I can still remember hitting a wall at some point and it wasn't just physical. It's also mental. Um, now I would probably attribute a lot of his success just to, to being, well, first of all, his dad, I mean, that that's, that's a resource that a lot of people, well, I think people are finally kind of becoming, you know, aware of, but, but that advantage of having an old man that played in the NHL for as long as, you know, Kachuk, same situation with Brady and growing up in that environment. I think that prepares them a little bit more too. They're just by, by chance going to be a little more confident too, in their play and their demeanor. Um, but yeah, with Sanderson, it's been so impressive because as a defenseman at that age, and I know I've talked about this ad nauseum, but he's just, He's just managed to find that consistently. And it's not that consistency. And it's not just his defensive play or his offensive play. It's it's just a combination of both every night. There was a sequence in Pittsburgh 
And I talked a little bit about this on 1200 the other day where it was in the second period. And it reminded me so much of Eric Carlson, where he was defending a three on two uh, Pittsburgh was entering the zone and he flagged down a puck. You know, there was an attempt to, to make a sauce play across the ice and it was within Sanderson's triangle and his stick. And he flaps it down, catches it, moves it to one of his players. I believe he moves it to another forward right there on the play and then jumps up in the rush. I mean, the whole sequence was just Eric, right? Like stops at a dime, breaks up a play aggressively. And then not only that, he's not, he's not content with that play, then jumps up in the rush and creates an odd man rush the other way. Now, that's just one play, but it's 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 a credit to what he's been able to do all year. It's all those little those little stick plays that he's doing, those little puck handling plays, those ten foot passes under pressure on the off in the offensive zone on the blue line when he's under pressure, does a little spin move, moves it on. It's incredible, and and he's and he's doing it consistently. It's not a fluke. It's not just having a hot game one night and then you know probably dropping a few where he really shows his true colors. It hasn't been the case. So yes. He has been, in my opinion, at least, when you're talking about the Calder Trophy, I hope people are paying attention to his play because he deserves he deserves to be in that conversation. I know Beniers has been terrific. He's putting up numbers. But, I mean, if you're play, paying attention to this as a defenseman, I mean, uh, he's your number one guy in Ottawa now. What more can you say? Yeah, four minor penalties all season long. I'm Insane. Sure you, I'm sure you had a few games along the way where you're cr- crashing. Forward. Pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you were taking someone else with you for at least one of them, I bet. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he's been, a, he's been great. We got a couple more things we need to get into with you, including maybe the best GIF on the internet. That's all coming up next. You're listening to Locked On Senators. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. They are the number one sportsbook in North America. They're the official partner sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. And for a good reason, I love their app, guys. You got to check it out. It's simple, safe, secure, easy to use. You can use the face ID to sign in so you can get your live bets in before the odds change. And there's so many different odds you can take a look at. There's money line, point spread, player props, the first to five shots. Yep, that's the one I like. And anything you want, you can find it on FanDuel. And you can combine your bets for a bigger chance at a bigger payout with same-game parlays. And if you're new, that's even better because they got a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back in your pocket if your first bet doesn't win. So download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Thank you for making Locked On NHL your first listen. We've got Mark Mathot with us. And Meth, we know you've heard a lot about Sidney Crosby over the years. And no, I'm not talking about the slash. And by the way, at Beer League in Winnipeg two weeks ago, a buddy on my team gets, gets whacked. He comes off. He doesn't know I'm from Ottawa. We don't even know each other. He goes, man, I'm feeling like Mark Mathot right now. As he's like, <laughs> as he's going like this with his hand, I got such a great kick out of that. So, um, love your it. Name lives in uh, infamy here in Winnipeg in multiple ways. Good. So, I'll jump Good. aside. Um, the best gift all time. I hope you know where I'm going with this. You're at the blue line. Sydney is waiting for the puck, waiting to be onside, and you're poking at Crosby, almost angling him towards the bench. And Mike Hoffman comes in with the fire hose, a.k.a. Gatorade (laughs) bottle, and dumps about half of it down Crosby's glove. Uh, Was that premeditated? I think you're able to say now uh, six years later. Yeah, I don't. you know, it's funny, that play, because I see the gif all the the time online. 10 out of 10. That was, was that in the playoffs or was that just before the playoffs? I forget. That was game six. I think it was game six. Oh, it was. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah, but I remember it, though. I remember uh, p- for whatever reason, I know I was just annoyed with him or something at the time. And I was putting my stick in his chest, just trying to get under his skin a little bit. Um, and then, uh, I could still, I, I don't remember. So I, in the moment, I never, I never saw Hoff squirting water in his glove, <laughs> but I can remember the linesman threatening to make a call. And, but, but I did it so subtle. It was so subtle and kind of, it was kind of nonchalant. It wasn't in, in an aggressive manner. So I think it made it difficult for the officials to call anything on that play. But when I look back, it was pretty stupid. Because, I mean, they easily could have called some sort of sticking penalty or or, or something, right? I, I don't know what the call would have been. But it just it was just one of those instinctual things where I he was right there. 
the play was developing up in the, at the far blue line and he was just stretching. He was trying to stretch me out on the, on, you know, in the neutral zone. And I just decided to put my stick in his crest and it was a way of keeping him there too. And at the same time, just kind of letting him know that I'm there and jabbing him a couple times in the crest. It wasn't any deeper than that. So you and Hoff didn't, didn't have a talk before. No, we didn't court. We didn't coordinate that. it. No, it was, but it was hilarious after the fact, when I saw the little video show up afterwards, because then you could see the distinct water squirting directly into his glove. But, but you know, I love that stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's gamesmanship. It's entertainment. It makes for great clips on TV. And, uh, you know, I, again, I'm not, when it comes to the theatrics of, of dirty play and, 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 and all the stuff that could potentially injure a player, of course, I'm not for it, but stuff like that, I think is, is great for the game because it, it, it reminds me of Biddington, couple of last week when I was on vacation, you know, like in the moment it's annoying. And you think, man, I hate that guy. Like, what is he doing? But look how much attention it garners, right? Like everyone's talking about it. Nobody got hurt on the play. So all that little extra stuff, it just adds to the entertainment value in the game. I know I'm, you guys know, I've never been a goon. I'm not about that kind of stuff when it comes to the play you know, on the ice, but a uh, big fan of all the little extracurriculars. It makes for good TV. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, hey, speaking of good TV, how about Dylan Ferguson coming in and having an absolute night for his first ever NHL start? I wanted to get your opinion on this. We we talked a little bit about this with Mando and Mads, uh, young goalies coming up and getting their shot and what that does to the team. But when you go from already having two young goalies in Mando and Mads, and that's your your duo right now for the Sens, and then another new go- young goalie comes up like, how does that feel for the locker room? Like, does that give you an extra kind of boost? Like, oh, we got to play the, this game for Fergie. It's new energy in here. Or is it kind of like, oh, man, like another kid getting his first start again? Like, how, how does yeah. that feel in the room? I think I think if you were if you were in a legitimate playoff position and you had that much inconsistency behind the, you know, behind you, then you'd be you'd be concerned and it wouldn't really be a rally thing. Right. But but in this case where you know, the odds are stacked against the team. Uh, the season's on the line. You're just fighting for a spot. You're just, you're in the mix to be in the mix and, and be fighting for a spot, but you're also realistic. Um, I think it's exciting. I think for a player on that team right now, it would be an exciting thing and something to play for, right? I mean, you're, you're looking for motivation. You're looking for a new cause. Well, what better than to try to, you know, win a game for a rookie in his first NHL start or wh- whatever the situation may be if they're younger. So I think for me, in Ferguson's case, I, I I'd be pumped for him. I'd want to win for him. I'd like to block that extra hard shot for him. You know what I mean? So that would be uh, my angle as a player playing in front of him. I, I'm surprised that it was even a discussion the other day that he may play in that back to back. That was a, a point of contention for me. At least I was talking about it with some of the other guys where to me, it wouldn't have been a discussion. I mean, you go with Sogard in Boston because you don't want to, you don't want to injure your player. And Ferguson just stopped almost 50 shots the night before. But anyway, Long story short, I think it's a no-brainer to start Ferguson tonight against Tampa. Give him an opportunity to get there. I mean, you're, the odds are still slim, but you're not mathematically eliminated, so you still have to have your mind right. You still have to be prepared for the game. But he showed that he can do the job. Uh, I think the only mild concern at the back of my mind, that little voice is saying, hopefully that first game that he played wasn't just sheer adrenaline and that there might be a bit of a, you know, a, a come down from that game. Uh, but I'm hoping for Ferguson's case, just me being a fan now, that he can kind of find that uh, that mojo again. Did you know who the name Dylan Ferguson was before two weeks ago? Of course. Yeah, because I remember the trade, right? So, you know, when, 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 Dallas, when Dallas picked me up, it was him in a second-round pick. And so when he popped you know back that, up. You know who that second-round pick became too, right? Sokolov, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy, yeah. you know, when you think about it that way. and. Um, so good, you know, good for Ottawa for capitalizing on that, right? They're on the right end of it. And if Ferguson turns out to be a hidden gem, everybody wins. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Pilsy, I guess I owe you 15 bucks. I didn't think you were going to know who Dylan Ferguson was. Uh, based on trade. I, I said, Mark, how would I know. not? I, yeah. Okay. You can, uh, you can eat transferring that Ross. I'll yeah. take it. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, hey, so we chatted with uh, Dylan's mental skills coach and um, as eccentric of a guy as you would expect, did you ever work with anybody on uh, whether it was a sports psychologist or anyone that helped you through your career? So when I, when I got to Ottawa, well, we had one in Columbus toward my last couple of years. I never used them. 
And then we had another one in Ottawa when I got to Ottawa. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it was my second year with Ottawa, but someone made a suggestion that I go speak to like a psycho, like a sports psychologist just to maybe calm my nerves or something. I don't know. But I went to a couple sessions and I mean, it never, it never did anything for me. Guys, I'm not saying that it, go ahead. Oh, we got breaking news. We'll hit on it right after Tyler Clevin okay. is an Ottawa Senator. Good, good, good stuff. Good to hear. Hopefully he gets a couple games in. I'm assuming he will, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Sorry to interrupt, well, well, but that's exciting. That's uh no, it's, it's huge. I know. Well, I'll, I'll leave it at this then sports psychologists are great for people especially people battling addiction or some serious issues, perhaps at home. In my case, I never really found any need for it. It didn't do anything for me. I thought the sessions yeah. were very awkward. And then I'd go home and be like, what, like what, what just happened? But for some, for some players, I think there's, there's a legitimate time and, and need for it. So again, I'm, I'm all for it. Anyway, let's talk about Clevin. Well, yeah, let's wrap up with that. What, what would you expect from him? If you're a teammate, 20 year old coming out of school, big body, yeah probably raw in terms of handling the puck, that sort of thing. Like if you were bringing him in, let's say you're in Wade Redden's position or one of the, like the, the defensive coaches, whether it's in the development side or if you're Jack Capuano and running the bench, how would you right. integrate a new kid coming out of college? Well, you're going to put him, uh, you, you want to, you want to insulate him as much as you can, at least to start before you can really see what he has. Uh, you're going to, you're, you're going to want to give him at least a couple practices just to get used to playing around the guys, slapping the puck around, get used to the pace. Uh, as far as who I would slot him with, that's a tough call. Uh, I don't have an answer there. I mean, I, I think at some point you want to have him with a competent D partner, but at the same time, the guy's a stay at home D man. So probably a puck mover, but maybe a player like Branstrom. But then again, Branstrom's a young kid, right? So I don't know what the right answer is there. I'll say this. He's young. I think people need to understand, like, how old is Clevin now? Is he 20, 21? He's 20, and uh, it's yeah. weird. The Senators have a bunch of birthday twins in their history. Uh, okay. I know him Him and Carson Latimer are both January 10th, and the only reason I know that is we had Carson Latimer on the show for the first time, fourth-round pick, and he comes yeah. on, go to his Twitter, and all the balloons come up. I was like, dude, is it your birthday today? <laughs> Hilarious. But yeah, J January so, 10th. He'll be 21 January 10th, and let okay. this sink in. He's five days younger than Tim Stutzla, which is Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny. Yeah, but it's also Crazy. different for a defenseman, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I totally. think Historically speaking, now Sanderson's an exception, but historically speaking, as we all know, they get, you know, into their mid twenties is usually when they peak. I, I I think for me, I can't give you guys an honest assessment and I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I've been watching Clevin play all year. You probably would know more than I would. Um, I think just from speaking, speaking from experience, I wasn't ready at 20, uh, but I also wasn't Tyler Clevin. So I, I don't know. I, I was a late bloomer. I need, I needed a lot of seasoning in the American league not only from a professional standpoint on the ice, but off the ice, right? Like I needed time to just figure myself out, learn how to live on my own, get into a good routine, learn how to pay all your bills, stupid, trivial stuff that people don't really think about can get very stressful as a player. And that all adds into it. So, um, you know, I'd like to see him play in Belleville first, but you know, give him a couple games, I guess, see what he has. Uh, you just don't want to crush his confidence. That's the only thing you have to be worried about. So if he does come up, plays a few, great. Uh, but really keep an eye on him. If you see him really start to drop, take him out, send him down, let him play down there. Yeah, well, it's an entry-level contract, so he's burning a year. This isn't a type of thing where he's signing a exactly. year and coming in on an ATO. So um, I'm, I'm hearing from my North Dakota source that this all came together late last night, and it was almost like with Jacob Bernard Docker where the contract took a little bit longer because you think yeah. they're, they're pushing for NHL games. Well, you can also bet that him and his camp when I say that, I mean, his agent, they're all, they're going to be like during this entire process, they will have needed assurances that there's, there's a spot for him, right? Like he had all the leverage for the most part and could have gone elsewhere if he wanted I to. I mean, the GM say you want to adopt him. Yeah. So my point, well, yeah, I know I heard that too. So my point is he would have discussed that with his agent. His agent would have assured him that is that he had conversations with the team that they'd make room for him in this lineup. So where that is, I have no idea, uh, but I'm damn well curious to see what happens here because, again, you're going to have to see some shuffling, and I don't know who comes out. Well, we're going to be all over this the next little while. We've been on the Tyler Clevin train since day one, and now the K train is coming to Ottawa. He's never been to Ottawa, Matt. 
All right. Well, he had a death in the family before uh, Sens development camp this year. And with COVID yeah. was never able to make it up. We know the college guys don't come to camp. So he has been as close to the team as wearing a hat when he got drafted. Well, lucky for, draft, lucky for right? him. Lucky for him. He avoided January and February. So he's coming down at the right time. Perfect. Well, I mean, he's from Fargo, North Dakota. I don't think weather. Good point. <laughs> but next time we get you on, Matt, we'll make sure to break down Tyler Clevin's game. And always a great laugh. Thanks so much for battling through. Yep. Mass priorities. TSN, Locked On Senators. We know that's why we love you so much. And so do all the listeners. So thanks again, man. Hope you feel a lot better soon. And looking forward to the next chat already. Thanks for having me, boys. All right, for Mark Mathot and Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan, and this has been the Locked On Senators Podcast, your team every day.